Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Walden Church. My name is David, and today uh, I have a question for you because I bet, I bet most of you have seen uh, kids fuss and fight, <laughs> right? And usually, what uh, gets me is how my two boys fight over stuff. Like one of them can have food or a place on the couch or maybe the video game controller. You know, that, that thing, that object, whatever it was, it's been sitting there in the living room for days. Nobody's touched it. But then as soon as one of them reaches for it, as soon as one of them starts using it, the other one inevitably says, oh, but I was going to use that. I, I wanted to use that. And what really gets me is the fact that they're arguing over objects and, and who they belong to, right? Because like, Pillow, pillows on the couch. <laughs> that's my pillow, right? They say that. That's my pillow. Or that's my spot, right? On the couch, that's my spot. That's my seat. They each have a, a specific side of the car that they always sit on. They have a specific chair at dinner time. They say, that's mine. And, and, uh, or I had it first, right? You've, you've heard that, right? You've heard that. Of course. Now, Obviously, as parents, we want kids to learn how to share, right? Especially if they're out in public, especially if they're with other people's kids. But there is something about once a person picks it up, then everybody else wants it. The people become possessive. And, and we say, that's, that's mine. And, and we don't really get much better as we grow up, right? We kind of get more possessive because we end up acquiring more and more toys, right? I mean, have you ever tried to help your parents, your parents, clean out their house? You know, you know, like, mom and dad, you're never gonna read these old copies of National Geographic, it's mine, right? I had a relative that was saving all the old plastic bread ties in a drawer, filling up the drawer with them. She had an entire drawer and I bet you and me, I mean, we're really not any better. We, we would be embarrassed, you and I. We'd be embarrassed if somebody came over and went through our garage, right, or went through our attic and looked at all the old, silly things that we are holding on to. And I'm sure if a stranger came along and they said, ski jackets, old teddy bears, an oil painting you did in high school, why are you saving all this stuff? What would our answer be? It's mine, right? Where am I gonna go with this? Oh yeah, I'm gonna talk about money today. Yep, that's right, the old money talk. Pastors have to talk about money once a year, it's kind of in their contract. But that's usually the sermon that you wanna skip. <laughs> you know, if it's on the church calendar, I'd, I'd skip it. And if you're visiting from out of town uh, this week, that's the worst, to show up the week the pastor's talking about money but let's just, let's just stop and, and check ourselves first, right? Because a pastor can talk about serving, and we're all fine with that. Spiritual gifts, great. Heaven, hell, the devil, it's fun every now and then. Love your neighbor, great talk. But money, ugh, no. I mean, is, is money even mentioned in the Bible? Sure enough, you do a little bit of research, and you'll discover that Jesus talked about money a lot. And if he wasn't talking directly about finances, he used the topic of finances as a reoccurring character in his parables. 11 of his 39 parables have features that show money or wealth. And there's over 2,300 verses in the Bible that talk about money. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's because we as people desperately need wisdom when it comes to our personal finances. I mean, if I did, if I was going to describe Jesus and I had one word to describe him, of course, I would say love, right? I would say love. But I think even Jesus realized that some of our struggle was with our spending habits, that we actually had more issues with money than we do with love. We, we also know that people in positions of power, people in our government, they also seem to have spending problems, right? So the fact is, 
people from all walks of life have the same issue, including how we handle money. There are certain, uh, certainly some people who have a much better handle on money than other people. However, what I've learned is that even the guy who's driving the nicest car could possibly also have very little money in the bank. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. In other words, Jesus is saying that there is a, there is a fragility to earthly investments. And, and we're finding this out all too well. The things that we hold on tightly to, the things that we say, this, this is mine, those things, they're temporary. Today, there are high rates of depreciation, identity theft. We have an unstable stock market. With all of that in mind, people are putting too much faith in their financial system. And they store up money. And all of it is just a big, huge game of chance. They feel like they're being forced to do something when they're asked to give it to the church, right? And they hang on to it instead like a child that's fighting over their toy. And let's be honest, I said, I mentioned the church. The church is no better, right? The church is no better. We, we've all seen poor examples of the way some churches and some uh, nonprofits handle their money. I get so tired of people saying, uh, in church that we should preach health and wealth and prosperity. The, there's, there's all kinds of beautifully adorned church buildings. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with a beautiful church. But they're there beside this gold-plated this or this silver-plated that, and they're telling the poorest of the poor people in their country that they could become rich if they would just invest their money into, into their ministry. And then the pastor gets on board his private yacht or his personal jet and he flies off for a week. I heard one minister say at one time, he promised that if, this, that if you, right, he says, if you just give us $10, then God would give you back $100. That's a great deal. But how could that work? That can't work, right? If, if it really worked like that, then the church should be sending everybody $10, <laughs> hoping that the church gets back $100. But it doesn't work like that. God is not your money changer. God is not your bookie. But I will tell you one thing. You will never be able to outgive God. Now, maybe I'm talking about money because it's that time of the year, summer is over, right? And... We've kind of gone through summer, 10 grand in the hole through every month, and maybe it's a good sermon to preach right now. But I think the best reason to preach about money this morning is because it's highly discussed in God's Word. First and foremost, I just want to reassure you, I am not out to get your money. I am not out to get your money. Classic survey many, many, many years ago, a survey was taken of churches across the states, and it was noticed that on average, 90% of the work done in our country today, 90% of the, the work done in the church in our country today, 90% is done by 20% of the people. 90% of the work is done by 20% of the people. It's also observed that 90% of the tithes and the offering were also given by 20% of the people. And I think the largest reason for that is we all have this misunderstanding about what the tithe and the offering is about. Because I'm sure that all too often people feel like someone is trying to force them to do something. And if we force them to do something, then they're holding on to their possessions and their wealth that much tighter. And so the second thing I want to say is no one wants to force you to do anything. No one wants to force you to do anything. If you go with me to the book of Malachi, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, and if you study the entire book of Malachi, which isn't really very long, it's only like four chapters long, uh, if you study the book, 
you can see that the nation of Israel is in decline, spiritual decline. And the reconstruction of the temple had been completed. And what happened almost immediately was corruption entered into it. And Malachi said, you have, you have polluted the bread upon the altar. Corruption was widespread. Divorce was a normal thing. People were sinning. The nation as a whole was going down spiritually. I know that doesn't sound relevant today. Nothing like that would happen today. Anyway, if you go to Malachi chapter 3, starting at verse 7, it says, From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, How shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will be blessed for you, will be the land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. In that passage, he starts off in verse 7 by saying, you have broken the law. You've broken the law. You have failed to keep the commandments that I have given you. You've done this for a long time, since the time of your fathers. So this is not a letter to a person, right? This is not one person who's just kind of, you know, lost their way. This is a letter to a group of people. This is a letter to a nation. And God says, but if you start obeying me again, I will return to you. And the people are shocked. In verse 7, they say, how, how shall we return? What do you mean, God? What are you talking about? How, how can we return to you? We're already with you, right? I mean, we haven't done anything wrong. We're righteous people. We're the chosen people. What are you, what are you talking about? How do we return? See, they don't even acknowledge that they have departed from God's law. And God answers them and says, Will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me? And again, they don't understand. And in verse 8, they say, how, how did we rob you? And we could just stop right there, and we could just ask that question of anyone, right? How, how does someone go about robbing someone? You can either take something that belongs to somebody else, or you can hold something back that belongs to somebody else. If you came into my store and you gave me a 20 and I was supposed to give you change, right? I didn't take anything from you. I was supposed to give you change, but I held it back. That would still be robbing you, right? I'm not giving you back what you are owed. Let me read to you something from Psalm 50. It says, I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. And if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. What is God saying there? He's saying, I don't need your offering. You come to me with your offering, and you think I need it? I don't need it. And you, you bring me food as an offering? I don't need food. What is, what is all this? And why does God say this? Why does God say he doesn't need your offering? He says, because it's all mine anyway. He says, don't act like I need this, because I don't need it. It's all mine. All of it is mine. God owns it all. God owns everything. So why do we ever think it's ours? Why do we hold on to it and say, it's mine? Well, because God's left us in charge of all of it. It's our responsibility to care for it. We call this stewardship, right? He owns the field, but we take care of the field. He owns all the animals, but we take care of the animals. And, and if it's time for us to give him something, it's fine because it's already his. Well, what if I need it? What, what if I need it? That's fine. That's fine. God allows us to use things. 
He has given you authority to use his stuff. But the mistake that we make is we've cared for it for such a long time, we've held on to it for so long that now we mistakenly believe that it's ours. And so when Israel asks, how did we rob you? He tells them in verse 8, in tithes and contributions. Now, most of you know the word tithe means 10, right? In the law of Moses, Leviticus chapter 27, the Israelites are commanded to tithe, and this includes the seed from the land, the fruit from the trees, every 10th animal from your herd, everything. But tithing has been around even longer than Moses. In Genesis chapter 14, we see Abraham, he gives a 10th of all his goods, everything he uh, acquired in battle, and he gives it to the high priest Melchizedek. And the Bible says that Melchizedek was the priest of the God Most High. In Genesis chapter 28, Jacob promised that he would give a tenth of all he received to the Lord. And it seems like we can even remember Cain and Abel, right? They go to God with an offering and they sacrifice to God. One gives the first fruits of his field and the other one gave from the first of his animals. Is an offering different than a tithe? Yes, I would say an offering is different than a tithe. I think offerings are when we go beyond that which we are responsible for. Now, some people would argue that what all these people were giving, fruits, plants, animals, stuff, right? Some people would say, well, that's different than giving money. That's not the same thing. You know, if I have, if I have uh, 10 crayons and I have to give one to God, that's not the same thing as having $10 and having to give one to God. But I don't think that, that's not a valid argument when you talk about wealth. I think even though people back then didn't necessarily have paper money and bank accounts, right? This was their money because it was everything they owned. This is what they had in order to survive. When the Bible talks about wealthy men, right? If you want to read a list of people who had wealth and you read lists like Job and Abraham, it doesn't say, oh, and he had $2,000 in the bank. It doesn't say that. Instead, they list all the animals that he owned as a way of showing you how wealthy he was. So their cattle back then, it's no different than paper money today. But look at the first part of verse 10 uh, in Malachi again. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now in verse 10, God says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. And there's a couple things that we could point out in that verse. First, when God says to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, what is he referring to? What is he referring to as a storehouse? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a specific room in the temple itself where these things are brought. So it's a building that's attached to the temple. It's, it's attached to the place of worship. So if we can relate that to today, right? God is saying, bring the whole tithe to your local church. Why? Why would God ask us to bring a tenth of our wealth to a local church? Well, the Levites, who were the priests, they did all the work that the Lord required. And the Levites were from the tribe of Israel. God made them the, the priests, right? But out of all the tribes, they were the only tribe that didn't receive land as an inheritance, like all the other tribes of Israel did. But they were brought the tithe so they could live, so they could survive, and so they could spend their time doing the things that God wanted them to do. And it went even farther than this. The tithe was used to carry on the work of the Lord. Now, am I saying that we should not give to other churches and that we shouldn't give to other ministries? Not at all. I think we should freely and willingly give to any ministry in which we feel like God is calling us to give. But I feel like the Bible does show us that the tithe or the tenth is taken to your local church. Anything else above and beyond the tithe would be the offering. Let me read Deuteronomy 26 to you. 
It says, when you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year, which is the year of tithing, give, giving it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your towns and be filled. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the sacred portions out of my house, and moreover, I have given it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all your commandments that you have commanded me. I have not transgressed any of your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. The tithe was to be used to carry out the work of the Lord, right? To advance the kingdom of God, but, like we just read from Deuteronomy, also to help people, right? The, the ministry, the church, the, the, the temple helped people in need. And I told you earlier about how uh, 20% of the people give 90% of the tithe that the church receives. I'm going to give you probably my, own, probably my own personal opinion right now, but I'm under the opinion that all the Christians in the church today of everyone who attends any sanctuary, any gathering of worship, if everybody who attended gave one-tenth, if they all followed the rule and gave a tenth to the Lord, I believe we wouldn't need government welfare programs. I believe we wouldn't need Medicare. I believe we wouldn't need, we wouldn't even have world hunger. Because if the church of Jesus was functioning the way he designed us to function, I believe there would be no need for any of those programs anymore. We would take care of one another. I think God gives us a, a, a graceful supply. That's my opinion. When God is talking to this nation, when God is talking to the people of Israel, he says, you're robbing me. And he goes on to tell them that they're under a curse right? You saw that. They're under a curse because they are robbing him. And the curse that he, that was promised to them was because they were being disobedient. There was a drought. There was bugs eating their plants. Um, grapes were falling off the vine before they were ripe and hitting the ground. And it was kind of like the people were saying, God, all these terrible things are happening to us, right? And we're becoming more poor, we're becoming more destitute, we're becoming more sick. You can see, right, God? You can see how bad of a year that it's been for us. So right now, we can't afford to tithe. It's not a good year for us to tithe. This happened to me once. I got a brand new job, and I was all set, all excited, you know, to, to give my first tithe check to the church. I was gonna tithe to the church. And that same week, I had to replace an entire tire on my truck. I was so mad. And it's like, you say, give to the church now at this point? Like, I don't know. The church doesn't need my money. I mean, I, I'm so far in debt. I have so many bills to pay. I have so many kids to feed. I can't afford to tithe. But God is telling the people, no, 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 no. You have it backwards. You can't afford not to tithe. God tells Israel, if you obey me in this, if you return to me what is mine, I will open the floodgates of heaven and I will pour out so much blessing on you that you won't have enough room for it. God says, you can't out give me. Now, we've done a lot of studying here and all of this was Old Testament, Mosaic, Levitical law, but that's kind of where it ends. There's no commandment, right? There's no 11th commandment <laughs> that says, thou shalt tithe. It's not, it's not there. Plus, nowhere in the Bible do you ever see Jesus command you to tithe. It's nowhere. Nowhere in the New Testament are we commanded to tithe. I mean, it's mentioned a few times, but there's no specific command that's given. So we might feel like the, chor the church is forcing us to give, but that's not actually what's happening. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you were hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill 
and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You know, if you know your plants, mint and dill, they are like super tiny, right? They're the tiniest of plants and leaves. And Jesus, Jesus is saying, you guys are, you're being so meticulous and so legalistic that you're going through and you're counting the leaves on your plant and you're making sure that you give one, one leaf for every 10 leaves. You're, you're getting way, way too legalistic. And then you're ignoring some of the heavier, more weightier uh, commands. Like you're not, you're, not, you're not interested in life. You're, you're, you're not following through with justice. You're not offering mercy. You're not being faithful. And Jesus says, you're, you're a hypocrite. And if you study this verse, what Jesus says is, I, I don't want you to give up paying your tithe, but don't tithe legalistically. Don't, don't cheat your brother and then turn around and, and pay me. And if you do that, you're a hypocrite, Jesus says. For Jesus, it's not about being legal. And it's not about observing the law. It was about love and following your heart. And I think that's why we are so confused when it comes to tithing. It's not a legal matter. It's not a command. It's a matter of the heart. It's not an Old Testament command. It's not a New Testament verse. It's a heart matter. The 10 percent tithing thing, it, it's just a guide. It's just a guide. Gross or net, it's just a guide. The best I can tell is a tenth is the minimum. A tenth is the minimum amount that's ever mentioned in the Bible as to how much we are supposed to give back. But Jesus is not up there with a calculator <laughs> adding everything up, saying, okay, all right, all right. How, how, much, how much do you owe me this week? I don't, that's not happening. Instead, I think Jesus is saying, how much do you love? How much do you love your fellow person? How much do you love God? And our actions dictate, show our heart, because this is a heart matter. Because if you're not the kind of person that wants to give freely, if you're not willing to give back a portion of what you've been allowed to have, if it bothers you to give it, then don't give it. I knew someone who told me once that uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, Paul said, God loves a cheerful giver. And my friend said, well, tithing doesn't make me cheerful, so I don't give. <laughs> but the word cheerful is derived from the original Greek, which means hilarious. And that's where we get the word hilarious from. <laughs> that means God wants us to be happy and willing, right? Willing to give. He wants us to give hilariously, not, not that we're happy before we give, right? But that giving should make us happy. Giving should make us happy. We should be happy to give. Because giving helps fulfill the great commandment. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And if we follow these commandments, if we love God with everything we have, with our total being, if we love our neighbors as ourselves, then we will learn. We will learn to let go. We will not hold tightly and say, this is mine. It's a heart matter. We'll, we'll say, instead, how much, how much further do you need us to go? How, how much do you want from me to help these children know more about Jesus? How much do you need to help those in need? How much do you want to help spread the gospel? How much do you want so that I can be a part of the kingdom work being done in this neighborhood? The Bible says in 1 John, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? 
I want you to notice one last thing that's here again in Malachi in verse 10. It says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. God says, test me. Test me in this. Try me. See what will happen if you're obedient. God says, test me in this. Because we can't outgive God. He may double your money, but he doesn't promise that. He does promise that he will bless you abundantly. He does promise that. And the Bible says, test me and see. I wish I had thought of this illustration I found, but I didn't think of it. Uh, I heard a famous preacher say once that most of us don't have the nerve to go to a restaurant and not leave a tip. Right? We just say, this is, that's so rude. And most of us would feel horrible if we gave anything less than 10%, 15%, right? And, and that we would be ashamed. I can't believe that, you know, are you the kind of person that leaves less? And yet we find it difficult to give 10% of God's money to him. It's not a legal matter. It's not a spiritual matter. It's a heart matter. And it's between you and God and what God is calling you to do. I'm not here to tell you to do anything. And I'm certainly not here to force you to do anything. I would just say, seek God's will in all things and just remind you that you can't outgive him. You can't outgive God. Let's pray. Lord, we know that this is a difficult topic for many of us, not just in regards to tithing, but just in how we use and spend and save our money. Perhaps the reason why there is so much to say about money in the Bible is because we need wisdom. That's why we buy books about how to generate wealth. That's why we go and listen to people speak about how to get out of debt, because we're curious how to handle money. Lord, we realize that it's all yours. Everything is yours. And we want to be che cheerful givers and we want to give back freely. We want to be good stewards of the things that you have left for us. So we just ask that you would continue to govern our hearts, walk with us through this matter, and help us to remember that we can't outgive you. And that if we would just follow you and obey you, you would continue to be our God our Heavenly Father, and bless us daily. Amen. Well, thanks for coming and hanging out with us. Thanks for being with us through this, uh, this topic. And we hope you've had a great summer, right? We hope you've had a great summer. Our kids are uh, returning to school this week in Texas. And so we're really, we're really all excited about that. But we have two services every Sunday that we'd love you to be a part of. We have a 930 traditional service on Sunday. We have a choir. They're going to sing all of your favorite standards, all your favorite hymns. Uh, we sing the doxology. We say the Lord's Prayer. We have communion. Uh, we do responsive readings. It's everything you remember from church growing up. Also, we have a contemporary service at 11. We have a worship band, and we just ask that you come casual, come however you feel comfortable, uh, and bring your kids, because our 11 o'clock hour is also when we have a children's program, youth. Uh, we have youth during the week as well. Our youth group meets every Wednesday at 5.30, and we will even feed them dinner. We'll keep them for about two hours, and we'll send them home to you. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.